It's the afternoon of September 27th, 2010. We are at the offices of Citigroup in Manhattan, where we're interviewing Lou Caden for the Rutgers program on the governor, the Brendan Byrne Archive. Lou is a vice chairman, the vice chairman of Citigroup. He was Brendan Byrne's chief counsel in the first two and a half years of Brendan Byrne's governorship. He's generally considered uh, one of the key individuals who helped Brendan get elected and helped him govern in the first term, along with Dick Leone. And we're going to get his recollections today. So let's start. How did you get associated with Brendan Byrne? It was really through Dick Leone. Uh, Dick uh, was a good friend of mine, really going back to uh, uh, 1967 and 8 when I was working for Robert Kennedy in the Senate and then the presidential campaign. And Dick was working for Governor Hughes in Trenton and uh, took a leave from the State House in Trenton to uh, work on the Kennedy campaign and became one of the uh, chief uh, uh, people managing the campaign in Oregon, in the Oregon primary, the, the only campaign that Robert Kennedy ever lost. Really? Uh, but that was where I met Dick Leone, and, um, and he was a cl by, by uh, the time of the Byrne campaign, Dick was a good friend, and uh, he uh, called me one day and said that he was uh, getting increasingly involved with Brendan Byrne, who had come off the bench to run for governor. This was while the primary was still going on, and asked if I uh, had some time and would go out to New Jersey and, and meet uh, then Judge Byrne. And that's uh, how it started. Do you remember what month that may have been? Or? Well, you know, the, pr the primary was in, uh, was in June, I think, in 73. And this was probably pretty close to the primary, so I suspect it was April or May. Let me just stay with Robert Kennedy for a second. Uh, what was your role? You, you worked for him in his Senate office, and then when you I worked for in the, Yeah, I, I worked in the Senate office, and then um, uh, when he uh, decided to run for president in uh, early 1968, uh, a few of us left the Senate office to work on the campaign, and I was the... Uh, Jeff Greenfield and I were the youngest of the legislative aides on the public policy side, and the two of us joined the campaign team and flew around the country from one primary to the next. Um, and I worked on uh, domestic policy and especially economic policy. Were and you, were um, you at the hotel and, and Jeff was the second speechwriter to Adam Walensky. Were you in the hotel on, in Los Angeles the night he was murdered? I, I, w I was until the night before. I wasn't there on, on the primary night. I'd been sent. Uh, we were all going to link up in New York for the New York primary. And um, I was asked to make a side trip to Florida on primary day while the rest were still in California to, um, uh, to see someone, to uh, see a business leader who was getting more and more involved in the campaign. And so I was doing that on primary day and was back in Washington by, uh, by the evening, watched the returns and, and, and the assassination and so on from Washington. You and Dick Leone are thought of 40 years later as the brain trust of the <laughs> Byrne administration. What was it about Robert Kennedy that drew both you and Leone to Kennedy as opposed to Eugene McCarthy, who half <laughs> the other young people in America were favoring at the time. Yeah. Um, I, I think in my case, I had the chance uh, to go to work for Robert Kennedy in the, the spring of 1967. He was, he, he was then a senator, and while there was talk about him running for president, he was still saying he wouldn't. Um, and I was graduating from law school. and. Um, he asked uh, Archibald Cox at Harvard and Harry Wellington at Yale if they would recommend a couple of recent law graduates uh, because he wanted to add a couple of younger people to his uh, policy staff. 
and Professor Cox recommended me, Professor Wellington recommended Jeff Greenfield, and the two of us started on the same day in May of 67. And uh, in those days, if you were the kid on the policy team, you were assigned the economic policy portfolio because the senior domestic legislative aide, who was Peter Edelman, who's now a law professor at Georgetown, was working on uh, the poverty agenda on jobs and training and poverty and welfare and so on. And that's how I became the economic policy advisor on Senator Kennedy's team. When he decided to run for president, those issues became even more important. And uh, together with a group of well-known economists who had been part of his brother's administration, um, I, uh, I did a lot of work on uh, economic policy. What drew me to Kennedy was the same thing that drew millions of people uh, to him, but he had a a, an unusual capacity to uh, combine uh, empathy with people in, who needed government to help them in different ways with um, uh, a hard-edged uh, political skills and political insight. And of course he was uh, strongly critical of uh, of uh, the Vietnam War, and so was I, so, was, so were most of the people I knew. And uh, so the chance to go to work for him, I was then, uh, I just turned uh, uh, 20, 25, I guess, when I went to work for him. It was a terrific experience. Between the time you met Judge Byrne and that time, you ran for Congress. Yeah, when, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, uh, of course, all of us were instantly out of work. We all gathered in New York, worked on the funeral preparations, and then went through the funeral experience. And while I was at the cemetery, actually, um, uh, Lloyd Cutler, who later was the counsel to two presidents, um, came up to me and and asked me if I'd get together with him the next day and wound up saying to me, which I always appreciated, that I, you know, I know you're out of a job, you're probably not sure what you want to do next, why don't you let me give you an office and a salary in what was then a small, very small law firm. I think there were 20 lawyers that, Wilmer Cutler in Washington. In Washington. Um, and, uh, and, and while well, you decide what you want to do. And so I did that from, uh, June of 68 until uh, December when I decided to come to New York. But you so ended up challenging a, what, what is So I came to New York and went to work for a prominent labor negotiator, mediator, arbitrator named Ted Keel, who was a major figure in labor relations in the United States in those days, and whom I had met through Senator Kennedy. Senator Kennedy was trying in that period, 1967-68, to persuade Keel to run against John Lindsay for mayor. Keel was a big figure in New York City, involved in politics and business and a lot of other things, a lot of civic activities. And he could never persuade him to be a candidate. I think he valued his other activities and didn't want to do that. But he uh, uh, contacted me shortly after the funeral and, and, and we began to talk about uh, whether I would go to work for him, which, which, you uh, did. which I did. And when I got to New York, and um, I got involved again through Dick Leone with, with a group of uh, reform Democrats in New Jersey. Um, uh, I think it was called the Democratic Policy Coalition or something like that. And um, I got more involved. It never really got too far, but included some members of the congressional delegation and some other uh, liberal Democrats in the, in the state who were trying to push the Democratic Party in a, in a more progressive direction. And um, that led by a circuitous route to the decision, because Vietnam was a dominant issue of the time. 
68 to 70, coming out of the 68 election. And that led to the uh, decision to run in the Democratic primary in central New Jersey, what was then the 15th congressional district, against a longtime incumbent. So it was a little bit like tilting at windmills, but a lot of uh, people I had met through Senator Kennedy and in the Kennedy campaign got involved in that campaign. When the U.S. invaded Cambodia, you may recall, uh, colleges closed so that students could uh, take time off to campaign in the spring of 1970. So I had thousands, literally thousands, of Princeton and Rutgers students volunteering for this campaign against one of the most powerful democratic organizations in the, in the country. And it was a seat that was pr predominantly democratic, so the primary was everything. And uh, we had 17, 18, 19-year-olds by the hundreds or thousands. Uh, unfortunately, the opposition had strong democratic organizations, especially in Perth Amboy and New Brunswick, where a good many of the primary voters were in those days. That was so I ran uh, uh, what became a, a fairly celebrated anti-war campaign. I was very young. I was, uh, when, the, when the primary started, I was uh, 27 and would have been the youngest member of Congress. And, um, and uh, the two days before the primary, the Washington Post predicted that this would be the upset of the year, an anti-war uh, Democrat challenging this powerful Democratic machine. Unfortunately, they got that wrong. <laughs> And we did very well in most of the towns in the district. I did very well, in, and but more of the voters were in Perth Amboy and New Brunswick. And uh, the incumbent beat me rather soundly there. The incumbent was Ed Patton, Ed, who had served how many terms? Edward J. Roughly? Patton. Well, he had been in Congress about, um, t about 15, 16 years, I think. But he was first elected to public office in 1928. So he had been uh, a figure in Middlesex County Democratic politics for a long time. Um, but he was a strong supporter of President Johnson and, and, and the Vietnam policy. And that was the frame for the, for the primary campaign. And um, so I did that in 1970. In 1972, I was the counsel to the Democratic Party uh, Convention Platform Committee. Richard Neustadt, who was a pr political scientist at Harvard, was the platform committee chairman who, uh, who picked me. He and then a he wrote a famous book on presidential He did politics. indeed. And then, uh, of course, in 73, and so I always kept in touch with uh, Dick Leone and, and some other friends in New Jersey who had been involved in the 1970 campaign or had been involved with Kennedy. And um, uh, so, as I say, when, when uh, Judge Byrne was recruited to run in the primary, um, uh, Dick Leone got involved with him, and fairly quickly, I don't think they knew each other before the early days uh, uh, after Brendan left the bench, but pretty quickly Leone was designated as the campaign manager and uh, asked me, to meet Byrne, and, and our relationship developed from, from that. Less in the primary, a little more in the, in the general election, and then, and then during the transition. Did you and Leon support Dick Coffey for governor at some point that year? I don't know about Leon. He may have. He was very close to Dick Coffey from Mercer County uh, politics. But I... Uh, lived in New York, and so I wasn't really in, involved in it, uh, in the campaign directly, until I got involved with, uh, with Brendan. And um, I got to know Brendan Byrne, and, and wound up, as I say, gradually spending a little more time on the campaign and doing some traveling with him and talk, talking about, about issues. I want to ask you your like. first impressions of Brendan Byrne, but I want to step back a couple of years to your run for Congress. You say that you ran up against a very strong organization that was David Wilentz's organization. That's right. What's your recollection of David Wilentz? Well, I knew, I knew um, 
uh, David Willentz and his children, including Robert Willentz, uh, very well because I'd grown up in Perth Amboy and my parents um, were involved in, in synagogue activities and Jewish charities with the Willentzes and, um, and the Hesses, Leon, Leon and Norma Hess were David Willentz's uh, daughter and son-in-law. And um, Perth Amboy had a very small Jewish community. Everybody was involved in the same activities. And in, in fact, it was Robert Willentz who uh, played a significant role in persuading me to apply to Harvard when it was time to go to college. And I was at Perth Amboy High School, and uh, he had gone to Harvard. Very few people in Perth Amboy had, and and um, and my father sent me to see Robert Wallens to talk about where I should think of applying. And those conversations had a big impact on my decision to uh, apply to Harvard and, and ultimately to go there. So I knew the Wallens family very well, and in that sense, the decision to run against uh, David Wallens's candidate was was an awkward one. Um, but I think as it turned out, um, uh, the other members of that family, not David Wallens himself, but his children, were, um, were among my most influential supporters in the primary, both Robert and, uh, and Leon. Did David try to persuade you not to run? He didn't persuade, try to persuade me not to run, although, although I, I remember uh, when, once the campaign got going and it was going hot and heavy and it was a few weeks before, a couple of weeks before the primary, uh, I was at uh, a restaurant in uh, Perth Amboy, st a restaurant that's still there called The Barge, and with my family, and um, uh, ran into Mr. Willens, and he came over and sat down at the table, and his basic message was, uh, you got to be sure not to get too discouraged by losing. And he told me the story. There was a leading Democratic politician in South Jersey who had run for office and lost and then committed suicide. <laughs> and he told me that story, and David Lentz was a great storyteller. And that's, and I still have very vivid recollection of, uh, of uh, the conversation about not getting too depressed if you uh, lost badly. Uh, you talked about this Democratic policy whatever its right. name was, coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, who else do you remember from it who we may have heard of subsequently? Well, f uh, Frank Thompson and uh, Henry Helstowski, who were two members of the congressional delegation, were both involved in it. And Frank Thompson, of course, uh, came to an unhappy end to his political career. And he got caught up in, uh, was it Abscam? Um, but in those days, in, in, in the late 60s, uh, Thompson was a very effective member of Congress and, um, and a very appealing person in many respects. He was very active in that sort of reform movement in, in New Jersey. Um, and Helstowski was a fairly liberal member of Congress from, uh, from Hudson County. Um, uh, Dan Gaby, who ran one of the local uh, advertising agencies and was a very close friend of Dick Leon's and ultimately of mine, was also very active in that. And there were some others, including some who got involved in the Byrne campaign. Um, Orrin Kramer, who then went to work for Dick Leon in Treasury um, and uh, is still involved in things in New Jersey. David Oxman, others. What was your impression of Brendan Byrne when Dick Leone, do you remember where the meeting was? I think the first meeting was at his house in, uh, in uh, South Orange. West Orange. West Orange. West Orange. What did you think of him? Do you recall? Yeah, I, I, I liked him uh, pretty much from the, from the beginning. He was, um, 
I, I, he had been involved in New Jersey government and, and New Jersey politics for a long time. He knew a lot about it. He had been uh, uh, a senior person on Governor Minor's staff. He had been the chairman of the Public Utilities Commission. And of course, he had been a successful prosecutor in Essex County and a, and a judge. So he knew the state and he knew all the characters involved in, um, uh, in state politics and state government uh, very well. Um, but he was also uh, always, uh, I, I think, not your typical political figure. He was, um, um, he, he was a little quirky and, and uh, but obviously decent and smart and of course the thing that everybody knew about him at the time the thing that ultimately made him governor in that race was this uh, story that had appeared in the New York Times that he was the man who couldn't be bought as a result of some organized crime tapes that and Ron Sullivan uh, uh, gave that prominent play when he announced for governor and that was pretty much the end of of the race, that plus the scandals that the Kale administration had and, and, um, and the support of the organization leaders it made the primary easy for him and, and the general election pretty much just as easy. So he was in many ways not a natural candidate, but the f his intelligence and thoughtfulness about the issues and his decency as a person I think came through the first time anybody met him, including the first conversation I had with him. What was quirky about him? <laughs> it's hard to know where, <laughs> where to start. <laughs> I mean, you could start with the white bucks and red socks or, or uh, but, he was, uh, but he was also, I think, temperamentally uh, unconventional compared to other people you run across who are running for a significant uh, office. I How think so? I I, th I think he was uh, he was very funny. Everybody knows that he's very funny as an after dinner speaker. But I think he always had a, a terrific sense of humor, even in casual conversation. And he was knowledgeable about public issues, but he wasn't particularly articulate a about them. Again, not like a lot of political figures you run across. Um, but I think, as I said, there was a sort of fundamental down-to-earth decency um, about him. Now, obviously, he had, he, I mean, he had, you know, he had lived in that part of New Jersey, I think, virtually all his life, and his family, a sizable family. Um, but, um, Although he was, in some sense, an obvious choice because of that public reputation that became so important for integrity at a time when the state was going through one of its periods of challenges to with fundamental integrity of its political system. Um, in many ways, he was an unconventional choice because he wasn't he wasn't naturally drawn to the interaction with people or to the public speaking that's part of being a candidate. Was he a weak speaker? I think in his own way he got to be quite a good speaker over time, just as he was always a good after-dinner speaker and quite engaging, but, but he didn't particularly like it and he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was a natural at it. And that was part of the adaptation to becoming a candidate. I remember one of the things that Dick Leon and I both knew David Garth, who had been John Lindsay's media advisor and uh, actually w helped me on my congressional campaign with radio ads. And he was very well known. He's probably in those days the best known media advisor in the country because of what he had done with John Lindsay. And we introduced him to Brendan Burney, wound up hiring Garth when the campaign hired Garth as their media advisor, I hired Peter Hart, who's still probably the most prominent Democratic pollster, polling firm in the country, uh, to do uh, opinion research. And I remember the first encounter with Garth, not the first conversation, I think we met 
Garth first in New York to interview him, in effect. But after he decided to work with him, one of the first working sessions they had, Garth did was he, what he always does with new candidates. Well, the candidate would tell him, and, and Byrne told him, look, I've, I've done this kind of television stuff lots, and I know how to do it. And Garth said, well, okay, we'll just turn on the camera, I'll ask you a few questions, and we'll get started. And as often happens in those kind of first sessions, you would say, it turns on, he turns on the camera, asks them a few questions, records the answers, and then shows them the tape. And it's a sobering experience for most new candidates, and it certainly was for, for Brendan. Um, and that's how they start to work together to, to get to get better. But I think, I think through that all, even though he may not have been a natural candidate in those respects, or in the, or in the uh, you know, glad handing or walking in, some, some people are naturally comfortable walking into a ballroom with a thousand people and, and uh, being very gregarious and outgoing for the hour that they're there. That's not Brendan Byrne. That's not really what he would choose to do. Left left uh, on his own. But I think through it all, and nor is he natural at getting up and giving a stem-winding speech about public policy, but through it all I think his fundamental decency and integrity comes through. And the other thing that eventually comes through when you get to know him better, which I think defined the kind of governor he ultimately was, was that the harder the issue or the harder the circumstance, the tougher-minded and stronger he gets. It's actually a quality he shared with Hugh Carey, who was the governor of New York during the same period. So it made him, but in his case, it made him someone who was easily underestimated by people who dealt with him. Did Garth try to work with him, try to train him? Garth worked with him constantly uh, the way media advisor, a good media advisor does, to try to get him to be crisper, more precise, um, more direct in responding. You have to do that on television. I mean, whether it's in, in ads, you can do it by reading a script, but, but in interviews, um, you have to learn how to do that better. And, and they did a lot of work on, on that. And I think, like anything else, practice makes people better. And ultimately, Byrne was able to draw on his natural strengths which are? Uh, his intelligence, thoughtfulness, sense of humor. Uh, you mentioned Jeff Greenfield uh, earlier. Did he work for David Garth? He did, but, uh, but I, I, I think that was earlier. Um, did he work for John Lindsay? He worked for John Lindsay, and he may, he may have still been with, with Lindsay. Maybe it was later that he worked for Garth, but he went through a period of working for Lindsay and then later with Garth. What did you do uh, during the primary campaign? What was your role? My, my role, as I say, it got more serious as, the, as time went on. During the primary campaign, I didn't do much, I, d I don't think. Uh, I kind of uh, appeared once in a while for meetings or conversations with, with uh, Brendan and, and Dick, Leon, Dick Leon and others, no. But during the general election, over time, I, I spent more time um, and got to the point where I was sort of doing a fair bit of traveling with Byrne um, to talk about issues and help go over the, the issue side of what he was going to do in the course of the day while somebody else dealt with keeping track of who he was going to see and the politics of the event. Or did you quit your job or take a leave? No, from not formally. I, I, what was I, your job at the I time? I did both. I was working for Ted Keel um, uh, in his law firm and in his mediation and arbitration practice, and I was living in New York. But in the course of the campaign, I, I, I spent a fair bit of time, not full time, but a fair bit of time, and then after he was elected, um, and Leon became the head of the transition overall, I became the head of policy, in effect, for the transition.
So you had to take and, a leave and, at that point. And I and I took a leave at that at that point, and in effect, never went back because in the course of the transition, uh, the governor elect asked me to take on the council's role, and, and I agreed to do that. Had there been a governor's chief counsel? In prior administration? Yeah, and in fact, uh, no, and that was a significant issue because they had been much older, uh, distinguished members of the New Jersey Bar. I was, whether or not I was distinguished in some circles, I was very young. You were 30. I was 30, and um, 31 by the, by the time of Election Day, turned 31 in, in 73. And... Um, uh, and at least at the start of the administration, I was not a member of the New Jersey Bar. And all of that, to, to pick somebody with that profile, that age, not a member of the Bar, was, was something of an issue for most of the leading lawyers, judges in New Jersey. And there had just been a, a, an experience with the, U, the, the United States Attorney, Herb Stern, who had not been a member of the New Jersey Bar when he became U.S. Attorney and asked the Supreme Court of New Jersey to waive him in, which they had the power to do, and, and they did. But that caused a furor among leaders of the Bar. And so when, when uh, the governor-elect asked me to become counsel, he and I also agreed in that same conversation that I would take the Bar exam and not ask for a waiver. They probably would have given me a waiver, as they had for Stern, but we didn't want that political issue. So in the first month of after Inauguration Day, I actually had to take the bar exam in February of 74, which was a little daunting because the whole, I didn't have time to prepare for it, and the whole state was watching the result, and, and Chief Justice Hughes was the one who called me up and said, well, you probably you probably don't want to put the score on your resume along with the Harvard Law Review, but you made it. <laughs> so um, that was a bit of an issue. And, and as, as you've probably seen if you've looked at news clips from the time, the whole idea of putting together a, an administration for the state in which Dick Leone was the state treasurer, he was maybe a year, year and a half older than I was, and I was the counsel. And Bill Holland, who was much older, but was also outside the Democratic Party establishment. He had been a Speaker of the Assembly, so he was a lot closer to, the, to it than we were, but he was politically outside the mainstream of the powerful uh, organizations in the Democratic Party. Um, and, and so to have the three of us in those positions was not what a lot of the party leaders who had supported Byrne when he came off the bench and was persuaded to become candidate, not what they would have predicted or expected. What does it say about Brendan Byrne? I think it's it says a lot. I mean, he he was his own person. They should have known that if they, since they had known him for some years. He was independent-minded, and he was determined to set a different tone. Uh, and a different quality in his judgment in the people he put assembled into the government. And, and so the whole administration, if you look at the cabinet and you look at the governor's staff, and you, um, he was going to pick the people he thought were the right people in those positions, even if they were unpredictable. And I, I suspect that, I, that both Leon and I were at the top of the list of those who were unpredictable because Brendan had grown up in New Jersey politics. He knew everyone. He had a lot of uh, people very close to him, including very capable people who had worked for him in the prosecutor's office and then in, in, uh, in, in the uh, minor administration. And probably some of them thought they might occupy these positions, and, and instead there was Leon in the most important financial position in the state government, and there was me, uh, both of us being very young and thought to be outsiders in party circle, Democratic Party circles, in, in uh, the, the most important position on the governor's staff. And as I say, Highland, even though he was a lot closer to a establishment force, was a little bit of the same thing, viewed as a, 
outsider in those circles. Uh, but that was, that captured, and we can go on and talk about how the cabinet was put together, because it was really the three of us who worked with uh, the governor. Tell us. Uh, elect, uh, and, and there too, he was determined to put a lot of different kinds of faces and backgrounds and to combine people he liked within who had been active in New Jersey affairs together with people he found elsewhere in the country, anywhere he thought he could find someone who would be good at different positions. And, you know, over time, you could have a debate about who turned out to be good and, and who didn't, but, but there was no question that during that formative period in, uh, uh, in November, December, leading up to Inauguration Day, and then spilling over a little bit into the first weeks of the administration, he was determined to set a different tone and, and reach pretty wide for the people who would serve in that cabinet. So some, like um, Anne Klein, who had been a primary opponent of his and a member of the assembly and joined the cabinet because he liked her. He thought he, she'd be a good uh, uh, commissioner of human services. It may have had a different name in, in those days. Um, essentially the health and welfare uh, services that the state provided. Um, and Ed Crabio, who became the Secretary of State, who had also been one of his uh, primary opponents, and, 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 uh, and Joe Hoffman, who had been in the minor administration and, and uh, involved in democratic politics for a long time. So there were people like that, and then there were some others whom we found in professional positions in their fields in other governments around the country. Like whom? Joanne Finley became the health commissioner and had been the health commissioner of the city of Philadelphia. Fred Burke, we, we looked all over the country for an education commissioner. Education was going to be a central issue, including education finance. And we found Fred Burke in Rhode Island, where he was the state commissioner. And he came to... Uh, uh, to New Jersey. David Bardeen had been in the federal government and uh, done various other things and came to New Jersey as the environmental commissioner. Before he settled on, uh, on Bill Hyland, Bill Hyland was the obvious choice for attorney general and everyone speculated that, um, that he was likely to be picked. But before he was picked, uh, the governor-elect put him through a fair bit of torture, including sending me on a mission to try to convince Nicholas Katzenbach, who had been the Attorney General of the United States, to take the job. How did that and, go? And, well, Katzenbach said he was flattered, but it didn't take him long to say that wasn't part of his life plan. Um, he was then the, the, at IBM. and um, But to me, all of that showed that, that Byrne was trying to sen send a different signal and make a different statement about the composition of, of the team that he was assembling to tackle the issues in New Jersey. Were you surprised when he asked you to be his counsel? Well, by that time, uh, I was pretty close to him as a result of all the time spent sort of in the second half of the, of the campaign, the, the general election campaign and the early part of the transition period. Um, and so I, I wasn't, on, on one hand I was surprised because the, the, he knew it was not going to be that well received by a lot of people he had counted on to get elected. And at the same time, we had gotten pretty close, so I wasn't surprised in, in that sense. And I, and I was excited to do it, but it was, it had its own personal complexity because um, I lived in New York. I didn't, it wasn't, the. I wound up staying in New York because my, my wife at the time uh, uh, would not move, but we spent a few weeks looking at houses to, to live in in Princeton and uh, that didn't work, but, so it was, it was difficult and, 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 um, um, 
and I had uh, one very small child and another one about to be born who was who was born just a couple of days before inauguration. So the, there are personal complexities to it, as there always are. Uh, during that campaign, uh, once Byrne won the primary, did you assume that he was going to win the general election because yes. he was up against the pretty conservative South Jersey? Yeah, and, and not a very strong general election opponent. So you never know in campaigns. You can always lose your lead or make mistakes. But he was the overwhelming favorite as, as a result of the way he was presented through the primary coming off the bench, having this reputation for great integrity, winning the primary decisively, having unified all the political leaders, the most important political leaders in the Democratic Party in the state, um, uh, it was not hard to, for us to tell on the inside. His, his natural inclinations weren't always aligned with those political leaders, so it was pretty clear. And of course his choices, including choices of Leon and myself, were not well aligned with them or, or their expectations. So it was pretty clear it would be a complex relationship with them. But he had united them politically. He was their candidate. and. Uh, um, Did Watergate play into that? Uh, Charles Sandman had been a supporter of Nixon's, but Nixon was still president. The Nixon was Watergate, still, yeah. Watergate ha didn't really yeah. come to a head until the following I, year. I, as I recall, it probably played a little bit into the backdrop of the importance of the integrity issue. But I think the Cahill scandals had, Cahill administration scandals, which were qu quite serious. Not really about Cahill himself. I think Cahill during the transition period was was very decent for, for, for us to deal with, and a, and a, and a and a pretty decent person I think. But but the the scandals during the Cahill administration had made that a central issue, and Byrne was an ideal candidate in those circumstances. And some of his most visible early proposals went to that issue were campaign finance reform, voter registration reform, the creation of a public advocate. Those are all things he talked about during the campaign and moved forward on in the, uh, in the first weeks of the administration. During the transition, uh, Governor Cahill appointed Dick uh, Hughes to be the Chief Justice. How did that strike you and Leon and Governor-elect Byrne? I think, well, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a specific recollection, and it may have been because I didn't know or wasn't part of that, uh, about whether uh, K Governor Cahill consulted uh, Byrne. I kind of doubt it. But I think, as I recall it, his, his reaction to the choice was pretty good. And and his working relationship with Governor Hughes and, and my own and others in the administration and Bill Hyland's um, was very good. Uh, Hughes was a remarkable individual. I mean, I hadn't been involved in New Jersey when he was governor, so everything I know about that is secondhand from the people who were close to him. I suspect he was a pretty good governor, too. But he was a terrific human being and, uh, and a very good Chief Justice. And I think my recollection is that, that uh, Brendan's reaction was was positive. Now it's possible that there was more to it than that, and I just wasn't aware of it. And by the time I was aware, it was positive and accomplished. <laughs> so, let's talk about the income tax, uh, which seems to have dominated those two and a half years. Yes, at least the time I was there. And let's start with what the governor said when he he was running for governor. Yeah that uh, he didn't see a need for a hike in the income tax, or a I'm sorry, the creation, in, of, the an creation of an income tax in the foreseeable, foreseeable future. future. Did, uh, did that box him in uh, unnecessarily? In hindsight, do you wish he hadn't said it? Uh, well, I think even at the time, there were lively discussions about the choice of words. Um, so that was a deliberate choice of words. Yeah. And, um, and, and the... Uh, 
evolution of his position or the transition to uh, a different position after he was elected, uh, sure, had, had, its, uh, had its awkward aspects or awkward. Uh, How do you finesse that? Well, I think in the end, he, he, he dealt with it in, in, in the only way he could, in a straightforward way. Um, and I don't think he could do much, much else. And I, I don't, I kind of doubt that he had regrets about how he had framed it. So whether anybody else or any others of us might have framed it differently if we were the candidate, we probably wouldn't have had his capacity to get as many votes. So it's uh, wrong to second guess it. But I think there's no question that the evolution of the position had its costs. Uh, because he, he fairly quickly came to the view as governor. I mean, we, didn't, we had an elaborate study done, team working on what our alternative, alternatives were in, on the school finance and taxation issue. Um, Cliff Goldman, who became the deputy treasurer, uh, did a lot of the, took the lead on a lot of that work, but there were lots of others who helped as well. And of course, Leon and, and I and Island were all, Island a little less because he had a responsibility to represent the state and we wound up taking a different position in the litigation from, this, from, from his constitutional obligation. But certainly Leon and I and all of us spent a huge amount of time on how to deal with the combined problem of school finance reform and taxation. Uh, and he fairly quickly came to the view, which he never wavered from, even though he knew what the potential political costs of it were, that, um, that you couldn't respond to the constitutional mandate to meet the thorough and efficient education test that the Supreme Court had, uh, had, had included in its ruling. You couldn't respond effectively to that and have a strong reform program without a new source of revenue, and the fairest new source of revenue was the income tax. And once having come to that position as governor, he never wavered from it. The, the rest of the two and a half years, I don't remember exactly which month we put forward that proposal, but it had to be in the first, somewhere in the first two or three months. And uh, he never wavered from that position, and the task from then on was how to get it achieved, get the votes and get it passed. I, I read something uh, that you wrote back in 74 in a memo that referred to a statewide property tax as an option. Was, do you recall whether that was a, a I viable th option in, I think so, of an income tax? I, I, I think all the options, statewide property tax, different forms of uh, consumption or sales tax, um, were studied, evaluated uh, over and over again. But my recollection of that, the, the, the decision making process was that he always came back to the basic conclusion that the fair way to do it was um, an income tax. Had the, and courts, had the courts at that point in 74 made a declaration that the state was not living up to t &E, or did that yes, come that, later in no, Robinson v. Cahill? No, the Robinson v. Cahill preceded uh, the, that's right. the election. K that's, that's why it was Cahill. Okay. And, um, and, and what transpired afterward in, in many iterations, you could probably tell me how many times I appeared before the Supreme Court on behalf of the governor, but it was, it was uh, several, but all those arguments were about the remedy and how much uh, patience the court would have before it took actions on its own and what those actions might be. And of course, you know that all ultimately came to a head in the issuance of an injunction uh, closing the schools effectively as of the end of June 1976. And then the- Not to reopen in September, and then unless the, there was- Unless there was a satisfactory implementation of the reform bill, which they had 
along the way, they had upheld as satisfactory if funded and enforced. How shocking or radical a, a declaration by the court was it, that? Exactly, and, and highly controversial. Um, in fact, one of the, I think it remains one of the more exciting adventures and interesting adventures that I had in my professional career because after the Supreme Court issued that injunction, um, the United States brought an action to enjoin it, in effect to enjoin the state court injunction, uh, a case called United States versus the Supreme Court of New Jersey, who, which interestingly- who, who was the plaintiff in that? I mean, the United States. Why? because the U.S. Attorney went to the Justice Department and got permission to bring this action against the, Supre Stern against the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey. Hmm. And, and this was in right, right, I think the argument took place on June 30th, I think, if I'm correct. But it was right around the end of June when the injunction was about to go into effect that the United States brought this action and it was ultimately embanked by the full district court, one of the few times in U.S. history. It's not unknown, but there have only been a couple of examples where a district court has heard a case with all the district court judges sitting. And that took place with tremendous fanfare. And there Did were, you argue? For yeah, and there were multiple parties representing the state legislature and the school board association. And, and Sitting where? In Newark? In Newark. But the critical parties, the critical contestants, were me on behalf of the governor of the state and, um, and the U.S. attorney, Herb Stern, on behalf of the, uh, of the United States. He was a and Republican. He was a Republican. The court included his two predecessors for whom he had worked. Fred Lacey and Jonathan Goldstein by then were both on the, the court. And the White House was I think I've got this right. Maybe Herb Stern was the, on the court and Jonathan Goldstein was the U.S. attorney. I think that's right, actually. So Jonathan Goldstein was the U.S. attorney who brought the action. His predecessor, Herb Stern, and Stern's predecessor, Fred Lacey, were judges on the court. And the White House was Republican, so it went along with right. this as well. Well, I think it's, yeah, it's the, the discretion is really in the Justice Department, but it probably wasn't, was, did not go unnoticed in the, in the White House. And so it was an enormously complex and celebrated uh, case in which we argued for virtually a full day in Newark. And then the court caucused now, I may not get these numbers precisely right, but I think there were 11 district court judges. And they came back from their caucus, and Judge Whipple, who was the chief judge, read a one-paragraph denial on behalf of nine of the judges. And then Judge Lacey and Judge Stern read lengthy dissents, which obviously had been prepared before the, the argument because not enough time had passed to draft them during the, during the judge's caucus. So the United States request for the injunction was denied, and um, Jonathan Goldstein, the U.S. Attorney, promptly went to the Circuit Court of Appeals in Philadelphia and the Circuit Court asked for briefs but put off the argument until the next day. And it was that night, I think, that the final vote on the income tax actually passed. Really? And the injunction was dissolved. Wow, that sounds like high so drama. It's, a, it's high drama in legal uh, circles. And the interesting thing, I think, I think this was true at the time, maybe by now it's different, but the opinions were never published. You know, virtually all court opinions in the federal system are published in the, in the uh, court reports. But it was very difficult, at least in those days, to get a hold of these opinions. Who were the key legislative personalities in the income tax fight on I think the, side? I, on think the, I think the critical, uh, there were many, 
But the critical architects who worked closely with us on the reform bill were um, uh, Steve Wiley and, and Al Bernstein. Um, but all the legislative leaders, Joe LaFonte, in the uh, in the assembly and uh, Jim Dugan and others in the in the Senate on the Democratic side were deeply engaged in the issues on an ongoing basis. I think Steve Persky, who is an assemblyman from Atlantic County, later a judge, um, was the chairman of the uh, of one of the relevant committees and was very much involved. And on the Republican side, uh, um, Tom Kane, who later succeeded Byrne uh, as governor, was the Republican leader in the assembly and someone with whom we had a lot of discussions about the issue. Our problem was not so much in the assembly, though, as in the Senate, where we, for more than two years, were one or sometimes two votes short. Your own party and the Republicans were equally difficult, or well, more of the Republicans were uniformly difficult. Tom um, Kane included. Tom Kane, I don't know if they ever voted for it, but uh, we had a very constructive relationship with Tom Kane, and we didn't have that much difficulty. It passed in the because we had a large majority. It passed in the assembly fairly quickly. The difficulty in the assembly was just getting over the hurdle of so many members of the assembly thinking it would spell the death of their political career if they voted for the tax. And the Senate was more difficult because we were consistently a voter too short. There were times when we thought we had pieced it together and then it would come apart. And um, um, Ray Bateman, who later ran for governor against Byrne in the second term, was one of the Republican leaders in the, in the Senate, and always someone that we thought was a potential vote in support. I don't think he ever actually supported it. And, um, and we had lengthy conversations with him over several years, over both of those years. But this was a one-on-one, -on -one. this was a one-by-one process because it was a highly complex and emotional issue politically, substantively, for almost every member of the legislature. You say legislators had to be worked on one-on-one. -on -one. Did you do some of that? Yes, I think we all did. But it wasn't really, I suppose it was in some sense working on, but because it was so protracted and so continuous in a way, it was it was different than most issues. Well, they really did, many of them, not, not all of them, but many of them honestly thought it would be a decisive and negative influence on their political career. Do you think anybody lost his seat? As Probably as some did. I can't remember whether Herb Klein was someone who was convinced that he would, and I think he may have lost after that. He's an assemblyman from Passaic County. And Brendan did not um, lose. Were you one of those who counseled him not to even bother? Uh, or I know you were gone from the administration by the time he ran. Yeah, for the no, election. no. I was. I, I always describe myself as as more in the center on that discussion and a little bit bit more more on the positive side than most others, with the exception of John Degnan. You probably know there was a critical meeting at the Princeton Club. I was already out of the government, but I was at that dinner. Um, along with uh, David Garth, uh, Dick Leone, John Degnan, myself. Not sure there was anybody else there. Maybe Jerry English was, I don't remember her being there. Um, in which um, David Garth presented, and Peter Hart presented the polling results and basically said that they didn't see a critical path to success and and governor's favorable rating was in the single digits was below 10 i think at the time this was in february of the of 77 and um and others were pretty negative about the 
possibilities. And, and Degnan argued most forcefully that he should run. And as I remember my position, maybe others would disagree, it was basically similar to advice I've given other candidates, which is, if you want to, you should. And what's the worst that could happen? You could lose. That's not the end of the world. But if you run, the only way to do it is to say what you think. You supported this or that because you thought it was the right thing. And and then see what happens, which is essentially what he did in the end. So I remember myself as not being so clear and forceful as Degnan, but certainly being tilting on the positive side. Let's talk about Giant Stadium. Uh, what was the status of the project when Byrne was elected governor when, during the transition? Yeah, when he was elected, the project had been approved and preliminary planning had been done, and the land was assembled, I, I think. For a football stadium or a racetrack? For both, or both. For both. And the, le the first negotiation of the lease with the Giants had already taken place, and the sports story had been created. Werblin had been, Sonny Werblin had been enlisted as its uh, chairman, but it was not financed. And financing it required what was then called in municipal finance circles a moral pledge of the state, not the state's full faith and credit, but a moral undertaking to support the bonds. Without that moral pledge, the, the bonds could not be sold. And without the new governor's support, the governor-elect's support after election day, there could be no moral pledge. And that was the issue. Would burn support the moral pledge so the bonds could be sold. And he wasn't sure. Why? I think that he, want, emotionally, he wanted to support it. He thought the creation of this facility would be good for the state, for the state's image and economic activity. He's a great sports fan. But on the other hand, he, he worried about the potential costs to the state and whether it would be successful. And again, he, we had some analysis done by, I think Cliff Goldman again was the one who did the analytic work on the numbers. And, um, and I was deeply involved, and as was Leon. And Jim Zazali, who was a lawyer in Newark who had worked for Byrne in the prosecutor's office, was enlisted to um, be involved with us. He later became Chief Justice of the state, but before that, at the beginning of the Byrne administration, he became the outside counsel to the Sports Authority. And so that was our little team analyzing it. And the upshot of that analysis was that he would support it if some changes could be made to the Giants' lease that would increase the revenue potential for the state by allowing sports activities other than the Giants' football games. In other words, perhaps another football team, ultimately it was the Jets, and concerts and so on, soccer, much of which, maybe not all, but much of which was not permitted under the original lease. And so we had, <coughs> we had a, a day or two of lease negotiations, <coughs> largely at the Princeton Club and partly at Sonny Werblin's apartment in New York in which the people I remember being there are Zazali and myself and the governor-elect, along with Sonny Werblin and his lawyer, Bud Foley, Adrian Foley, and um, representatives of the Giants, uh, led by Wellington Marrow. And, um, and we made those changes. So the governor was able to say, we've changed the economics of the project by permitting these additional activities in the new stadium. And on that basis, he supported the uh, moral pledge and the financing went ahead. But that was a big challenge because Governor Rockefeller led a veto by New York financial institutions of the bonds. So the normal buyers of those bonds all 
blacklisted it, basically. New York was fighting this project. To, so that the Giants wouldn't move. And we wound up, the governor, Dick Leone, myself, there were probably others involved, wound up essentially selling the bonds door to door among the major companies in New Jersey. Prudential, Mutual Benefit, Fidelity Bank, Johnson & Johnson, and so on. So in, I think this was before Inauguration Day, but we were uh, the, the governor-elect and his core team, principally in this case, Leon and myself, were bond salesmen for a week or two. How much money did you have to raise? I remember, somebody asked me that the other day because of the new stadium opening and the billion, billion, dollar billion dollar six. I remember this bond issue as being something like 375 or 400 million. It was in that range. There was uh, a lot of bonds to sell in 1973. Uh, well, let's talk about some of the key players in getting the sports complex uh, mm -hmm. fully developed. Uh, Governor Cahill, did, uh, did he play a key role? Well, he certainly played a key role in the formative stages before the election, before uh, Burns' election. He was the original uh, supporter and promoter of it. And Joe McCrane, was he uh, Cahill's? He was the state treasurer. treasurer? I, I didn't know him. I think he got in some trouble before I got involved. In he was one of the I think so. scandals that I think so. we talked about when we talked about I think so. I, I, I hope scandals. I'm not wrong about that. I think he was. What was Werblin like? Well, Werblin was a great personality. He actually became a very close friend of mine. And I probably had, um, I mean, the governor had a fair amount of dealings with him, and of course, Leon, as the state treasurer, was on the Sports Authority board, as was Bill Hyland as Attorney General. But I probably had as much interaction with him during that period and during the first year or so of uh, of the Byrne administration as anybody did. And he was a terrific personality. He had been known to be in all the things he had done earlier in his life in Hollywood and. And uh, what was he in Hollywood? sports? He was one of the leading agents in Hollywood, um, and um, uh, and then he had uh, he he had helped put together the the Jets franchise and, and was he the owner of the Jets? Well, he was one of the, he was one of the owners, but but Leon Hess was the dominant owner, and Sonny was uh, one of his partners. He was also involved in Monmouth Park. He was a great racing fan. He had he horses guy? of his own. He, was, he lived in uh, uh, the Rumson area and also in New York. And he was a great personality. He was a terrific fun to be around. And uh, I spent a great deal of time with him in, in, in those days. And he was a very good salesman. I think his enthusiasm about the project played an important part in in uh, Brendan's support and in Brendan's own enthusiasm. Uh, Don Linke uh, suggests that Sonny Werblin as an agent, as a Hollywood agent, rescued Ronald Reagan's That's right. career by getting him the job as a spokesman for General Electric. That's right. He was very close to Ronald Reagan. Um, how about Wellington Mara? What was he like? I thought Wellington Mara was a was a great gentleman, very decent to deal with, and a, and a very uh, appealing human being. And I think that was his general reputation. I didn't really get to know at that time. I guess I've gotten to know him a little bit since, but I didn't get to know Tim Mara. He was sort of around some of these meetings, but he was still pretty young. And and Well Mara carried the carried the leadership role. Uh, David Wilentz, did he get involved in trying but, to... I, I think he stuff? did. I don't remember the sequence of... Uh, and, and, but I also don't recall that being a significant factor in Burns' decision-making uh, or, or being an issue between them after uh, the governor-elect decided to support it. 
uh, Governor the connection was to the Jets and Monmouth Park. Park. It was more a racing politics uh, ah. issue because of Wilentz's role and Hess's role in Monmouth Park. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, ben and Burn always, from from the beginning of the time I met him, had a uh, a, a respectful relationship with David Wilentz as did we all when I was in the State House. I used to get calls from him first thing in the morning. If I got to the State House at 7 o'clock within 5 or 10 minutes, I'd get a call from General Valence. He was up and had read all the newspapers and wanted to convey his suggestions for the day to the governor. Were they welcomed? Uh, sure. He was still very astute. He was well in his 80s by that point, I think, but very sharp and... Um, and very supportive, but he always had ideas. He'd read papers, he had ideas about bills and public issues and political issues and appointments. And then he always had opinion, he always concluded the conversation by telling me that I had been a failure because I hadn't gotten him to take off those red socks and white bucks. And I said there were some things beyond my authority. Um, but Brendan always had tremendous uh, amount of respect for Robert Wallens. And, and I, th I mean, ultimately, in the second term, he appointed him Chief Justice, but I think um, he always had a high regard for his uh, opinion, his intelligence, judgment. Probably always th tried to think about ways to involve him in different ways in the administration, even before he appointed them to the Supreme Court. Did Sonny Werblin resent Brendan Burns' oversight of the sports authority? Yeah, he probably did on, on some level. Um, and he probably, uh, you know, I think their relationship got better over time, but there's probably always a bit of an edge to it. And, uh, but that's sort of part of the governmental process that you have. That's one of the reasons you, sometimes your senior staff are buffers in those relationships, helping take some of the edges off. I think fundamentally they had a decent working relationship that got better over time. Who yelled at you during the burn years that you were there? Who yelled Who at yelled me? At you? Well, there were a lot of political leaders and members of the legislature who effectively yelled at me frequently about one thing or another. Um, um, I don't think I ever, I think when the governor got angry, he got quiet. I don't think I could remember ever being yelled at by Brendan Byrne. Um, it wasn't his, wasn't his uh, uh, style. Were you and Leon uh, resented in the legislature uh, I because think, you were so young and I think, I so think, smart? Well, I don't know about smart, but the, I think I think we were. I, I think it was just jarring to people who had worked their way up in the political system and were in important positions in the legislature or in the party apparatus, party leaders to discover, and, and then who had, particularly those who had participated in persuading, in, in deciding that Byrne was the person they were going to support, to sort out the primary, to be their candidate, and they persuaded him to come off the bench and run with their support. And I think it was pretty jarring to them to wake up after the election and confront the fact that the people who, Two of the people he was putting in the most important positions in his administration were these two, you know, 31, 32 year olds um, who were identified as whatever else they were, smart or not, they were not from, from the party establishment. And I think that was hard and, and you know, I had dealings with a lot of them and, and, and I hope that over time 
they became more constructive relationships, probably some did. Some were always edgy and, and, and didn't really become better until years later when you just time yeah. cures everything. Yeah. But that included, that included the, remember in those days there were very strong, important party leaders in the major counties who had a lot of influence over their own members of the legislature. The We've already talked Francis about Fitzpatrick, whom Byrne yeah. appointed to be the head of the Turnpike Authority. Harry Lerner, who was the leader of Essex County. Um, Will Lentz. Um, then there were a couple, of, it was a little different structure in, in the southern part of the state, but there were it was the mayor of Camden, who was also a state senator. Eric Eddy. Eric Eddy. And uh, in Atlanta County, I guess the Democratic Party had two wings, the Persky wing and the McGann wing. Uh, so th this, was a, this was a Democratic Party with organizational strength that today sounds like a different era, but was in the 70s Did those still, people call the still very call? powerful. Did they call you? Oh, sure. And um, and their perception of my influence probably exceeded the real influence, but they didn't like any part of it, I don't think. Um, and of course, Leon had been more involved in New Jersey, so he was a little better known to them, but that didn't necessarily make him better liked. Um, and he was more of a political, he had been the campaign manager, he was more of a political person than I was. Did you ever manage a campaign in Camden? No. no. Okay. Um, Jim Dugan was another player. <laughs> yeah, Jim Dugan was another one. I mean, D Jim Dugan was a was a uh, important senator. He became the state chairman, uh, essentially picked by Francis Fitzpatrick, but endorsed and supported by uh, Byrne. And um, and there was a lot of tension in that relationship. Between With Brandon all of us, between Jim Brendan and Jim Dugan, and between what was the Dugan and the rest of us. What was the source of that? I don't know what the origins were. I think it was just cultural. I, I guess I would, I would say um, Brendan had grown up in the, in the heart of the Democratic Party, but he wasn't temperamentally or culturally part of it, of the party in its old st structure of powerful county leaders and party discipline. He certainly understood it. I mean, he had, he had been the secretary to Governor Minor and, and, um, and lived with a lot of the same tensions in Minor's relationship with party leaders. But um, And in his own way, he, he, he could be they liked certain things about him. I mean, they liked his sense of humor. They liked his political support, especially when he was strong. But at the same time, and, and, and they respected his intelligence. He'd gone to Princeton and Harvard Law School. But that wasn't, that wasn't the world that they were most comfortable with. And, and, and I think they, there was always a tension in, in how independent-minded he was reflected it in the people he had around him as, as well as his own predispositions. So it was a it was just a complicated relationship. It was that way from the start. They probably thought or, or wanted to think that they s believed they had made him governor. They told him that he'd be elected if he resigned from the bench and they provided all the infrastructure and support to make that happen. And um, but he was not, there was no way he was going to be the kind of governor that maybe the state had had in the past who, um, who checked with them on everything he did or, or uh, spent a lot of time trying to please them. He, he just wasn't going to govern that way. Uh, did they but he had to maintain decent relationships with them because they all had a lot of influence over their own members in the legislature. Uh, were, were the disagreements largely about patronage positions or? Well, sometimes it was appointments. 
president. And sometimes, it was, and sometimes it was issues, but most of it I think of as more temperamental and cultural than specific. I mean, sure, they would want to appoint somebody, and he uh, wouldn't want to, and frequently just wouldn't. I mean, you know, he had thresholds for people he appointed, especially judges and prosecutors. And, um, but it wasn't as if it was a dominant theme of conflict all the time. He had cordial relationships with them, too because you have to do a lot of, uh, there's a lot of back and forth always. Why did you leave after two and a half years? Well, it was really uh, uh, personal. I had, I had two young children. I had barely been home for two and a half years. And uh, I was showing in the strains in my marriage, which ultimately led to a divorce a couple of years after I left. Trenton. Um, I had no money and was going broke at a rapid pace. And uh, so he added that all up. It was, it was, I would have liked to stay longer actually. I'd love the job. But, but after two and a half years and the uh, success on the school finance and tax bill, it was, it was really pretty much a, a personal decision that was necessary. What was the other top issue you worked on in those two and a half years beyond the income tax well, and I think, the sports complex? Yeah, I think there were, I think there were a lot because I think we, we worked pretty hard on making the government do a better job in each department. So there was a substantial agenda, some legislative, some administrative. Uh, we always had a, a list of priority actions we wanted to take in each area, in education, including higher education, in the environmental department, in health and human services, in, uh, in, the, in the governmental process issues. I mean, as I said, the, 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 the first legislative initiatives we put forward and, and, and got passed in, in the days in the early part of the administration when we would devise the priority list on, on, on a weekend, meet with the legislative leaders on Monday morning, have the bill ready to be introduced Monday afternoon, and be able to sign it by the end of the week. Because we had strong majorities and good support. So voter registration, campaign finance, the creation of the public advocate, there were a lot of things like that. We had a significant agenda in trying to improve and reform the public authorities, including the Port of New York Authority, which we had to do together with uh, uh, the governor of New York, first Rockefeller and then Kerry. Um, so I think it was an activist administration. There were always, they didn't rise to the, to the, all of them to the front page issues like school finance but or the sports authority but there were always um, significant things we were trying to do in that given week or or month and a lot of them we we did get done especially in those first couple of years i think it was 76 where the voters approved the casino referendum in Atlanta. yeah State. the casino initiative was a somewhat different kind of issue because uh, I, I guess dick can speak for himself but i had a lot of reservations about it which i expressed to the governor, but he had a personal view that it was important for Atlantic City and good for the state and that he wanted to do it. He wanted to do it the right way. He wanted the regulatory structure to be much better than anywhere else where it had been tried. We, we made a trip to uh, Nevada uh, during the time we were discussing whether to go forward with it, with the referendum. But he instinctively was always for it. And he probably knew that if I had had a vote, I wouldn't have been. But you helped him of course. implement his policy. Uh, of course, and helped design the regulatory system and, and, um, and, and make some of the early choices we wanted. We didn't always succeed. We wanted the first, um, uh, the first casinos to be 
built and owned by what we regarded as the strongest, best hotel companies in the country as part of setting a, a tone of what companies like. it was going to be like, like Lowe's, Hyatt. Didn't work out that way. It turned out to be Resorts International, Bally. Um, but it wasn't for lack of trying. And, um, and, uh, and, we want, and, we, and we worked very hard on the, um, on the regulatory system, and I think did a pretty good job in the circumstances. And of course, over time, I, I'm not sure it did for Atlantic City what, what the governor had hoped, but that's a much longer story. I'm told that originally Governor Byrne wanted state-run casinos. He, uh, I, yeah, why did he change? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. He, he did express that, but I'm, my recollection is it wasn't, it wasn't a firm or fixed point of view. It was part of the discussion back and forth about how you, if you were for it, if you w thought it would be good for Atlantic City and for the state, what was the best way to structure it? to make it as high quality as possible? And would, it, would there be a better chance of maintaining integrity standards and keeping organized crime out, all of that, um, if it were state-owned? And, he, and he had, those are serious questions, and he had a serious interest in them. But I don't recall it being a fixed position or, or any kind of disappointment. I think it was a, it was a point to discuss. In hindsight, do you think there were any mistakes made in the casino legislation? I'm sure there were, but but I lost touch with the issue pretty quickly after I left, and and uh, I mean I was in a, all of us were in Atlantic City a fair bit while we were in office because there were always conventions there and meetings of different trade associations and groups, league of municipalities, mayors' groups. Uh, uh, legislative retreats, uh, business groups. So all of us uh, went back and forth a fair bit, but I'm not sure I ever went again after I, after I left Trent. I don't think, I'm not sure I've been there. Um, I know I've not, not been in a casino, but I'm not sure I've been in uh, Atlantic City since mid-76. Um, Well, these are tough problems. I mean, how to uh, how to structure casino gambling so it achieves the economic development objectives and and do so with integrity and proper enforcement, regulatory enforcement. Those are hard hard issues, hard issues anywhere. But to do it in the middle of a metropolitan area like the New York, New Jersey area, is especially difficult. Byrne had a great background, of course, in law enforcement. He was very comfortable with those issues, had, had clear ideas about them, and very good judgment. I mean, I think I've, of all the people I've dealt with in the course of my career, I always thought he had a great combination of understanding how much power the state, the government, has in matters of criminal justice and how much responsibility, as a result, you have to exercise it prudently. So he was pretty tough, I suspect, as a prosecutor or as a judge, but um, but in a in a quite nuanced and, and sophisticated way, I think. Let's go back to Robinson v. Cahill, if we could, uh, and ask you whether, in hindsight, uh, a different remedy could have been more effective. Yeah, that's an interesting question, and I, which, which I guess years ago when I was teaching law. I, after I left Trenton, I thought about a lot. I haven't thought about that much since. I'm not sure it could have been. There, there, there are two dimensions to the, to the remedy. First of all is, is how do you ensure an effective education, one that's fair and equitable but also educationally sound? That's an enormously complicated debate that goes on to this day. 
I mean, we debated at, at great length during the period when we were putting together the uh, thorough and efficient bill with Senator Wiley and Ber uh, Assemblyman Burstein and others, um, how much you relied on inputs, outputs, and process. And there were advocates, and we canvassed a lot of experts around the country. Those debates are still going on today. And the balance that we struck in the New Jersey bill, I, I think it was a pretty sound one probably even today. But you get the same controversy about it today. You see it all the time in debates about standardized tests and output measurements, which has probably risen in, in, in appeal o over the years. Um, I came to believe that all three were keenly important, that you needed resources, you needed more inputs, more dollars. Um, but you had to spend them better than many districts did. And you needed accountability and measurements of performance, but you couldn't get carried away with it. You can, I still believe that some of today's debate is skewed too much toward um, measuring accountability solely by achievement tests. And fundamentally, since it's a public policy process, you need the right process, the right involvement of interested stakeholders. So that was the core of the bill we put together. Cliff Goldman was as important an architect, but so were Wiley and Burstein and, and some of the rest of us. And then on the funding, as I said earlier, I don't think there was any way to produce the resources and meet the state's other responsibilities without introducing an income tax. I don't think it's an accident that virtually every uh, state in the union that, that has a, a decent standard of, of public responsibility, public services, has a diverse series of revenue measures, including an income tax. And it's better if the income tax is progressive, all, all the things that went into our, our proposal. And it's never going to be politically easy, but I think it was the right thing to do. I think we were lucky that Chief Justice Hughes had the strength and the, and, 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 and the conviction himself and the ability to get the votes from his colleagues to support it so steadfastly because it required departing from a lot of the norms of how judges stay in their own backyard in their own in their own dimension he had to do bold things i wonder if being a former governor helped sure and having the political skills that he had and and the and the breadth of perspective that he had um, and he got essentially all the members of the court to join him. Um, so I think on the whole, it was it was a good moment in in New Jersey history and and public policy decisions. And the burn deserves a huge amount of credit for leading it so rigorously and with such steadfastness. And and because none of it was self evident, you got lots of potential governors who wouldn't have had the stomach for it. Do you know if there was any back-channel communication between Governor Byrne and Chief Justice Hughes? Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and I don't know. I, uh, you know, there are lots of different ways that communication didn't take place. I don't think there really was too much, but point of view was was pretty evident. I mean, it was evident in the formal proceedings and evident in the... the point of view of whom? Of, of both of them. And they were pretty similar. Yeah. And, um, and also, Byrne's decision, which I was part of uh, and, and then carried out, but the decision to separate himself from the state and have separate representation in the proceeding and take aggressive positions on the remedial matter, even if it created a clash with the legislature's view of their prerogatives, it was a critical, decisive, really, decision. Very few governors would have had the stomach to do what that. What do you mean by separating himself from the state? What, what, what he took, you know, most governors. Uh, 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 are obliged to defend the constitutionality of 
of laws, not attack them. And, and, um, and he decided early in the litigation to appear separately himself. Actually, I think the first, in the first iteration of that, he actually made the argument himself, didn't he, Don? And, uh, and, and then I made all the subsequent ones. Uh, but that was decisive because that framed the issue. Case wasn't between, you know, the plaintiffs and uh, who, were, who were representatives of school children, and uh, and the state government. It was really between the governor and the legislature on whether this new bill would be constitutional and whether it would be uh, implemented effectively. Uh, it's an incredibly have bold thing to do, and he did it at and carried it through for those two and a half years. And most people predicted that would be the end of him politically. Didn't turn out to be, but couldn't have predicted that. Uh, some people have suggested that that was an opportunity back then to mandate county school districts, statewide county districts. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of things, in, including in hindsight, that, that one could have uh, Considered, but as as is always the true true in politics and government, you make you make uh, minute to minute judgments about where to draw the line, which issues to take on, and which ones not to. And there are hundreds of them. Um, I think on the whole, this this bill, and of course it went on through many more chapters after Byrne was gone, after I was long gone. And, uh, but I think on the whole, it stands up pretty well as an example of, uh, of uh, good government and a strong governor. You uh, mentioned New York Governor Hugh Carey. Uh, we know from your bio that you worked with Governor Cuomo mm -hmm. in New York. Um, we often say that the New, York, New Jersey governorship is the most powerful uh -huh. governorship in America. Uh, how do the, the gubernatorial powers of the two states. Well, the New Jersey, yeah, the New Jersey governor has more uh, power in, in that sense because he appoints all the judges, all the prosecutors. There was at that time no other statewide elected official other than the uh, governor, appoints all the members of the administration. Um, the attorney general whom he appoints has a full array of criminal justice powers at his disposal, a permanent grand jury, wiretapping power under appropriate safeguards, uh, witness immunity, um, and, and a staff in the Attorney General that had been built up by Byrne's predecessors um, that was really a model of a quality uh, enforcement apparatus, law enforcement apparatus in the in in state governments anywhere in the country. New York's very different than that. New York has a powerful government governor because it's New York, but the governor doesn't have a line item veto or, or um, the same power over ensuring a balanced budget, um, does not appoint uh, many of the judges, doesn't appoint any of the prosecutors, does not have First of all, he doesn't appoint the attorney general, but the attorney general doesn't have the same array of criminal justice power. So it's a very different structure, not as extreme as Texas or other places where there's a much weaker structure of government for, for the governor's office. But New Jersey is quite distinctive, and that's a legacy of uh, Chief Justice Vanderbilt and, and other governors. But it is New York. It's a very big and important part of the U.S. Uh, governmental apparatus. During the transition, uh, the governor-elect and I had a m meeting with Governor Rockefeller in his townhouse, in his personal townhouse, which he used as a New York office. And uh, he had all these e extraordinarily capable and well-known figures come in one at a time to brief Governor Byrne, the new governor-elect, about transportation and law enforcement and education and so on. It was quite impressive. And then uh, when he went out of office, well, he became vice president, and um, 
of the United States, and, and Governor Carey was elected in 74. Um, I remember very well the first meeting between the two of them. David Burke, who had been a friend of mine, because he was the chief of staff for Ted Kennedy in the Senate when I was working for Robert Kennedy. Um, he was the chief of staff. They had a chief of staff structure in New York. He was the chief of staff for Governor Carey. So he and Governor Carey met with Governor Byrne and me. And uh, it was an array of issues, how to get control and reform the Port Authority, a series of other issues between the two states. And Burke and I were deputized to go meet with the chairman of the Port Authority after the meeting. So I actually left the meeting and rode with Governor Carey and David Burke. So we get in the car while Governor Byrne went off somewhere else. We get in the car and Governor Carey turns to me and said, you know, that guy's more Irish than I am. And there was a certain amount of truth to it. So they always had a, a, a good relationship on the one hand, but a kind of wary relationship because they were both what kind of- What does that mean, more Irish? Uh, Strong-willed. Strong-willed. Uh -huh. It could mean funny, <laughs> good sense of humor, but I think what he meant was, I bet he can be tough in the crunch. And, um, and uh, Carrie could too. They had a pretty good relationship. And of course, Byrne played a role in creating the coalition of Northeast governors, including all the governors from Massachusetts to uh, Pennsylvania. So looking back, uh, what were Brendan Byrne's strengths and weaknesses? Oh, I think his great strength, as I said, was the, the tougher, tougher the issue, the better, stronger he was. The more he brought to it, his intelligence, his judgment, his experience, totally focused on making the best decision as he saw, saw it, with a great ability to take account of all the moving pieces, all the, all the different factors. Um, and I think when the issues weren't so important, you know, he had his own style and manner and it suited him pretty well. As he could be pretty distracted. He could prefer to spend time on the tennis court or doing whatever he thought was fun to do um, rather than uh, you know, have a meeting every half hour the way other people thought maybe he should. But in, in a crunch, I think he was as good as, uh, as anybody I've worked with. And, public policy side of life, um, and um, so in that sense, it was it was enormous, uh, enormously satisfying and fun. It's one of the great. Also, a senior staff position like that in the state house in a place like New Jersey is about. I'm sure it's, I never got to do it in the White House, so I don't know. But um, it's about as good as it comes in, in terms of serving in the government. So How so? I, I never had any regrets. Well, the variety, the diversity of the issues every day, the ability to assemble a quality staff. I, mean, I think in those days, it wasn't a huge number, but the people we had working in the council's office, the young lawyers, and uh, people working on the policy staff, many of whom were not lawyers, were as good as any state house in the, in the country. So if Brendan Byrne were, were to be remembered for a couple of accomplishments, what would they be? I think, uh, again, p other people might have a different list, but I think the school finance reform, setting the school finance issue on the right track in line with the Supreme Court's decision would have to be on the list. And I think tax reform was was an important uh, part of that. I think he also upgraded the quality of uh, decision-making and public services and policies in departments like environmental protection. And there are a bunch of specifics that priorities he had for wetlands and and other environmental issues, but um, and, and land preservation and so on. But I think he uh, brought that to a better level than it had been in New Jersey before. 
And the political integrity uh, measures I think he did make. His administration wasn't totally free from problems, but none of the dimension that had characterized so many of the administrations before him, uh, or to some extent after him. Um, and I think some of the reforms he made in that area were important. Easier voter registration, campaign finance, and so on. But more fundamentally, I think he set a tone of, of um, what standards and practices were acceptable and what were not that was very important. Important anywhere, but especially important in, in New Jersey. You're the vice chairman of one of the largest, if not the largest, bank in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you're speaking about those days as if they were really the salad days, uh, the great Well, days. it was very satisfying. Look, I was, uh, as we talked about before, I was 31 years old, and I had the chance to play the central role in one of the most interesting, complex state governments in the, in the country with a governor who was an activist, who every day tried to think of how he could use the power. See, I think what many people don't appreciate is uh, elected officials divide into two camps. There are a limited number who think the reason for being there is to figure out how you can use the power of the office and the mandate you've been given by the people who elected you to make the conditions of life and the opportunities better for the people who live in that jurisdiction, or what as are many the of them as possible. What are the other group? There are others who don't approach it that way, who, who, who believe that government should do less, should spend less, should be more modest. We know that. I mean, our politics is divided between people with, with those contrasting points of view. I never understood why you go to all the trouble to do it live it every day. I mean, it's nice to I remember right after the election, I had no experience in New Jersey government, so I wasn't quite sure what people were talking about, but a number of people I ran into in the first days after he was elected kept talking about cars and helicopters and all the perquisites that came with the governor's mansion, and it didn't sort of register with me. I mean, I eventually learned what that was all about, but, but that can't be why, why you do it. Any more than that's why you do it in a big company. You have those things to make the logistics a little easier. But, but fundamentally, I think the same way about a, a company like this, or, or like ArcelorMittal, where I'm the lead director and it's the biggest steel company in the world. What you need to do every day is try to figure out what your priorities are. It's a game of triage. What could you do today? What could you pay attention to today that would make it better? for whoever the stakeholders are. In a company, it's shareholders and employees and communities to some extent, and in a state government, it's, it's the people who elected you. And many of them have enormous problems and, and barriers to opportunity, and so anytime you can figure out, we could do these six things this month, it, it would improve it. And that's what we tried to do. I think that's what all the people worked on the policy side of the policy and legal side of the governor's office uh, did. And, and I think to a person, they all had a good time, and Don was one of them, but I think they all had a good time too because there was so much energy behind it. Um, and that's what made it so, uh, so exciting. You still in touch with Brendan Byrne? Yeah. I actually uh, was able to go to, uh, he has a Christmas lunch, a sort of reunion lunch every year. I'd never been able to go until this past Christmas. And every now and then he comes in here and we, you know, I think he, uh, I, I know when, I, I mean, I think we were always reasonably close and stayed in touch. And when I was teaching law or practicing law, he was probably proud of what I had done on some level. But I think he was, he had a funny reaction when I took this job and he sort of saw all the publicity and, and the scope of the company and everything. That was before the fiscal crisis when everybody treated us a little differently. I mean, I think he was, I think he was uh, pleased that some, that one of them, he feels the same way about John Degnan and the things he's been able to do and others. Um, but those two and a half years were terrific 
fun. Didn't mean there weren't frustrations. Probably were frustrations of one kind or another every day, but um, I think you can't reproduce these opportunities. That's the same way I feel about this this company. It's 110 countries, and every day you can try to think about what you have the ability to do that might improve the performance in a couple of them. 